uh, advised by David Sontag. Her research focuses on machine learning tools to improve clinical care and deepen our understanding of human health with applications in areas such as heart failure and intimate partner violence. Her work is being published in both machine learning conferences such as Neurops and medical journals such as Native Nature Medicine uh, and the AMA Journal of Ethics and covered by media outlets, including the MIT Tech Review and many other illustrious uh, publications. Prior to her PhD, uh, she did her uh, AB in applied math in computer engineering from Harvard University. Um, so uh, Irene, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Give me one second as I wrestle over the control for, oh, okay. Can you see that? Can we get a... Thumbs up, maybe. You are good to go. I can see uh, what appears to be a very uh, official looking slide okay. deck. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm trying a new setup where I'm now standing up. I think it'll give me a little bit more. Um, oh, maybe. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Irene. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely introduction and for the Trustworthy Machine Learning Initiative for inviting me today. Um, I am a fifth year PhD student at MIT, advised by David Sontag, and today I'll be presenting on machine learning for equitable healthcare. I do want to take this moment to shout out all of my collaborators without whom I would not be able to you know, do this kind of research um, and have this great uh, cross pollination of ideas. So they're listed at the bottom, but there are also many more who've contributed in ideas and discussions. So thank you to all of them. Um, today, as you, some of you may know, there's a lot of optimism, a lot of excitement about machine learning in healthcare. So right now, powered by very large observational clinical data sets that span many modalities, imaging, um, uh, uh, like uh, natural language processing, all the clinical notes, um, other, other bio, biomarkers, um, machine learning algorithms can do tremendous things in the medical space. And in fact, models can beat human experts, particularly in the medical imaging, uh, in the medical imaging realm. At the same time, the regulation is evolving, um, as in America, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, but in other countries as well, try to figure out what these algorithms can actually do, what they should be approved to do, um, and how we should think about them. Practically, as a, you know, a potential patient, we might think about it as you enter the hospital, and you tell your problems to your doctor and your doctor might use an algorithm to assist them in providing you with clinical care. So this algorithm has been trained then on all the patients who have come before you, all of the medical knowledge that's available to the doctors, um, what those patients, how they were treated, and then any outcomes they, those patients had as a result of any treatment or any clinical care they received. Uh, the doctor then takes all of that information, um, processes it and then she uses the algorithm to output and her own medical knowledge to determine patient care. The problem is that when we learn from previous patients, we may actually be learning from a flawed system. So the clinical setting right now as it exists actually already contains pretty known disparities. Um, as two salient examples in this hodgepodge of headlines, um, one is that black mothers have worse pregnancy related outcomes compared to white mothers even when adjusting for education, for location, across the board, still worse outcomes. And number two is that women do not receive pain treatment at the same rates as men, even for the same reported treatments. This is starting to raise some questions then about what kind of data we're putting into the model and also what settings we're using models for and how we should be careful about this. Uh, when we start to bring algorithms into the picture, we wanna make sure though that the algorithms are not perpetuating this inequity. So although algorithms themselves are inscrutable, maybe they're black box, maybe they're a little bit more opaque, okay, maybe they're very complex, we are starting to get a little bit more insight into all the ways that this bias may manifest. So for example, on the left, dermatology data sets are used to train deep learning algorithms that can compete with humans, as I mentioned earlier. This is great. They can match humans, we can scale, um, we can reach places where they're not specialists necessarily. However, they may be trained on data primarily from fair skin patients. This is not very helpful or reassuring to patients who are darker skinned. And another example on the right, uh, care management program. So this is insurers often use a, um, an algorithm or some sort of risk scoring to predict a patient's health need 
for the next year. So based on this year, how much need are you going to have next year? And if you're going to have a lot of health need, we should enroll you into a care management program. We should reach out, we should call you, make sure that you have extra support from clinical staff and follow-ups, et cetera. However, algorithm, this analysis by these, by these researchers showed that this algorithm in particular showed racial bias uh, between black patients and white patients because it was trained on a cost instead of health need. So black patients historically have lower health utilization because of a host of historical questions of inequity. And now because they have lower health util utilization, they have lower um, costs in the previous year. And therefore this algorithm may be instead predicting that they might not need as much in the future. And this is incredibly problematic because it is used to allocate resources. I also want to give a little bit of evidence of how this field is growing. So in the last few years, a number of workshops and even conferences are focusing on this topic of machine learning for equitable healthcare. In 2019, I created the first ever FAIR machine learning and health workshop at NeurIPS. Um, and now in 2000, uh, as one of the organizers of the machine learning for health workshop. So machine learning for health is one of the largest workshops at NeurIPS. The theme this year will be advancing healthcare for all. And this is an explicit challenge to the community about the need to consider how algorithms can help or they can hurt healthcare and how what our responsibility adhere as well. So today, in a very short amount of time, I'm going to try to talk you through two different projects to illustrate two potential approaches for how to produce equitable healthcare. So the first case study will talk about how to audit a score once we've already discovered it can be biased. So at the very end of the process, the doctor is looking at this risk score, about to treat a patient with it. How can we figure out if it is biased and how we could fix it at that stage? And then the second case study we'll look at is how we can think about algorithms one step of a before that, before deployment, how can we model known health inequities in the process itself? Um, here we'll be looking at access to care as a way to infer a latent variable. I'll go ahead and pause there. Am I? I am not moderating the question and answer, so feel free to chime in if anyone has any questions. All right, Sarah, I'm relying on you to cut in um, if, I, if there are people who have questions. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, there's a great usage of scoring models, machine learning scoring models across the board, um, particularly in high stakes settings these days. So a lot of bias audits then are occurring in these fields. So one method of bias auditing would then be to look at an, take an algorithm, take all the scores, and look at how it performs on smaller subpopulations. The algorithm itself could be trained on the larger population, but we're really interested in smaller groups and seeing if they're being treated equally, they have comparable performance across the board. So on the left, we have a figure from some analysis from researchers who looked at face detection algorithms and their accuracy um, on a combination of either male and female or light skin and dark skin. And it turns out dark skin women have much lower accuracy compared to the other three subgroups. This is pretty problematic. In the healthcare setting, um, we have even more concerns. So black patients are more likely to die from breast cancer than white patients. Just forget it, you know, even before algorithms came into the picture. So if we're using an algorithm to detect breast cancer from mammographies, then we would want to make sure that we have comparable performance for black patients and white patients. Otherwise, we're just perpetuating the same inequity that exists already. So these researchers luckily did do that analysis as part of their standard performance analysis. And in addition to, perform, uh, to presenting analysis for one group, they presented it for subgroups as well. In our work, we looked at the mental context of intensive care unit patients and predicting hospital mortality based on the first 48 hours of clinical notes. So someone comes in, take all these notes about them, unstructured data, can we predict what's gonna to happen to them and maybe we could allocate care accordingly. Uh, we found actually looking at this data that if you built a model like this, there are statistically significant differences between race. So race here is patient self-identified racial groups and statistically significant differences means 95 percentile and their confidence intervals non-overlapping. Um, the natural next question is, uh-oh, like we didn't mean to make this algorithm racist. We didn't mean to pr produce this bias. What do we do now? 
there is an existing branch of fairness literature that often looks at the trade-off between accuracy and fairness. So the reasoning here is that if one group A, this sort of orangey color, is less error than the group B, which is more of this golden rod yellow color, um, then this could be the disparate impact of the algorithm. We might want to improve fairness by increasing the error for one group, um, for example, using regularization or fairness constraints. In medical settings, we can already see that this is not very palatable and potentially unethical. Instead, we want to broaden our range of actions. Instead of just looking at the machine learning model and what it spits out, what if we thought about the, uh, the data it uses instead and the data collection process as well? One way to decompose the fairness, figure out what's going on, and then potentially how we would fix it would be to examine the bias, variance, and noise that were used in this algorithm. So as a refresher, bias, variance, and noise are the statistical components that together make up the algorithmic error. The bias corresponds to sort of how the model class influences the error. The variance corresponds to how much sample size, you know, how big your data set is, how much that contributes to the error. And lastly, noise is irreducible, independent of model, independent of sample size. What kind of um, measurement error do we have going on? So each corresponds to a potential source and a potential fix for our uh, differences in error. Because we often define unfairness as the differences in error, we can decompose unfairness into the differences in bias, the differences in variance, and the differences in noise. Once uh, the task then becomes identifying which one of these is contributing the most to the unfairness, and then once we know that, we can take these actions outlined in the slide here. So once we know which one's going on, we can figure out which one we want to fix. And, uh, and our work in particular focuses on how do we detect which one is which. Um, we might, for example, be concerned with variance. As I mentioned in maybe the dermatology case, the data set has not that many dark skinned people. Maybe it's too small of a data set. In machine learning, we can characterize the relationship between the training data size and the model performance using an inverse power law. This is a, called a type two learning curve. Um, in, uh, so by subsampling the data, we can actually estimate this inverse power law and the nice thing about the inverse parallel is it has this asymptote term, which means that in the infinite data regime, as you get more and more data, you will actually figure out what happens as data goes to infinity. And if variance is causing the unfairness, then the asymptote should basically go to zero, and we know that we need to get more data instead. This is a surprisingly powerful tool, and in a lot of the cases we looked at, it is turns out to be um, variance is contributing a big part to the error. Another potential source is actually noise. So as I mentioned earlier, noise is the inherent error. It's independent of model class and sample size, and uh, it's sort of how the different groups, how predictable are they? One method to address the noise is to find subsets of the data where the difference in error is high across groups. We can then start to isolate where we should collect more features. So back to the intensive care unit example. We were able to, one, show statistical significant racial differences. That's the slide I showed before. Two, we could estimate the impact of variance using these inverse power laws. And that's what this graph is. So for all the different groups, what does it look like as we add more data? And then we found that actually in the infinite data limit, there's still differences in error. So there's still unfairness, even if we had infinite data. And then we also looked at um, topic modeling to start to identify which clusters have higher noise, which subgroup should we perhaps be getting more features from in an effort to reduce noise? All right, pausing for questions. Uh, so we do have one question okay. uh, from Roseanne. Uh, so let me, uh, let me share that with you now. So uh, do we have data comparing biases exhibited by humans versus by ML systems in the clinical setting and how do they compare? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, we are actually about to address partially that, but I would say that it is often hard to separate the two um, in the framework that I just showed of bias variance and noise. So one way to do that is to think about what's contributing noise. So noise can be human errors, like you know, racist doctors, or it could be the algorithm not being able to determine what's going on. And so that's sort of a... a, a 
a big source of conflict. I would say bias and variance are definitely about the model. They're definitely about the algorithm. They're definitely about how we train it. But noise becomes this murky area. So I'll just use that as a transition to go ahead. Um, one way we can think about what's causing the noise is that perhaps there are systemic health disparities that cause the noise. We don't, I'm not saying it's all, all of noise is systemic health disparities, but certainly systemic health disparities can cause noise. Um, one way to characterize disparities is disparities of access to care, which means that not everyone can see the doctor when they need to be. Uh, disparities in treatment, meaning that two different patients with the exact same uh, symptoms may not receive the same treatment. As an example, the women were receiving pain medication less than men example. And then lastly, disparities in outcome uh, show that across different groups, people do not have the same life expectancy. And this is sort of a red flag that something is going wrong perhaps earlier in the pipeline. Um, as one clinical example, just try to get into these health disparities, I wanna look at the question of disease progression. So we might have some notion of disease sever severity, we're gonna call that disease burden, and higher is worse. So it could be some sort of biomarker, it could be a pain threshold, but just basically higher is worse. And we wanna see over time what happens to a patient. If we get a bunch of longitudinal data, we could probably map out vaguely what it looks like for patients over time. So here a patient kind of goes up and then maybe they're fine and then they get a lot worse. Um, this could guide treatment to figure out when do we wanna be really aggressive with treatment or when is the patient gonna be mostly okay for a while. And then also to offer accurate patient prognosis to tell patients, hey, it's gonna be okay or actually maybe you should start thinking about um, what, what you want you know, your end of life to look like. One problem is that we actually only see the patient once she is diagnosed. Um, if, already, you can start to think that access to care starts to play into this. You can imagine that if they don't have access to care, if she doesn't have access to care, maybe the diagnosis time gets pushed way to the end as opposed to earlier if she has great health insurance. Um, another problem, in addition, is that different patients may progress differently. So perhaps if you are younger, um, you will look very different than someone who is much older and we want to be able to characterize that as well. Maybe there's not just one linear path. To formalize this, I want to think a little bit about how there are, you know, how we would describe confounding factors. So let's say we want to learn how disease burden, we're going to call this the lead time um, that patients can enter the healthcare at different times. If there's one patient, say this purple patient, comes in a little bit later and we align them properly, we can still learn that path. But if we don't align them, all of a sudden we've introduced noise, we've already started to corrupt the algorithm learning process. That's sort of one confounding factor. Another confounding factor is that patients may manifest differently. So perhaps in different subtypes. Um, this is an example in asthmatic patients actually. So it's known that there's sort of different types of wheezers, late onset wheezers, transient earlier wheezers. And as someone who had childhood asthma, it's sort of interesting to me that it can be so known that it's so different. Traditional unsupervised learning clustering algorithms are limited though in the observed data space, and they don't have this ability to align patients based on potentially where their uh, diagnosis time was. We actually don't even know how far to align it because that is a latent variable. So instead, we learned a deep generative model and this decouples the disease subtype and also the alignment of the patient. So using variational inference, we can model the observed longitudinal data to learn both the alignment and the uh, heterogeneity of the patient of the these phenotypes, which then allows us to learn subtypes. So um, in actual data, in addition to synthetic data, where we showed we could recover it, we also looked at heart failure data and Parkinson's disease. So for heart failure, we are able to identify known heart failure subtypes and identify factors like gender and obesity, which have already been known that these patients might progress differently when we can actually recover that in the data of how these specific patients start to progress as well. All right, um, I am gonna barrel through and finish this and then I'll pause for questions. So uh, where do we go from here? Today I talked about two very quick case studies of how we could approach maybe two different angles of equitable, uh, equitable healthcare using machine learning. Um, this is actually a picture I took in the White Mountains uh, last month, so highly recommend hiking the White Mountains if you're in the New England area. Um, these are beautiful, but similar to that, we actually have a long way to go, just as I had a long way to go in this hike at this point. 
Um, I wanna close with an examination of sort of the bigger picture. It's important to keep the entire model pipeline in mind. Today, we only discuss two parts and in fact, the two last parts, but equitable healthcare requires careful thinking at each step. For example, even picking which disease to study, the very first step, which clinical use cases we wanna target, which projects get funded, they all follow under problem selection and they can steer the rest of the pipeline for machine learning as well. So in closing, if you want to take away three things from here, one, we can audit bias after the fact in supervised learning. Two, we can accommodate disparities in access to care um, by you know, cre in creating methods that can do that. And then three, there is this larger pipeline that we need to consider. Um, and I challenge all of you to think about how you know, systemic inequity can, can enter each part. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irene. That was wonderful. Uh, we already have what I think is a very pertinent question, uh, but I'll, I'll read it out. And then in the meantime, if uh, the attendees want to ask another question, feel free to jot it down. Um, but the question is actually excellent. Uh, it's asked by Haley James, and uh, it's getting to the heart of what I think is one of the most tricky parts of fairness research right now. So Haley asks, it seems as the number of subgroups, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status increases, examining fairness for each potential person becomes unfeasible. Uh, I think what Haley's getting at is the overlap of different identities. Is there work considering this issue in these systems, such as uh, measuring individual fairness, which I assume is getting at this overlap of different, different features? Um, that's a great question, Haley. Thank you for raising that. So today's talk has focused primarily on, I guess, group fairness. So we know what the group is, either the patients told us or we have some sort of proxy, and then we want to audit based on those groups. Um, intersectionality, when you want to have like, you know, um, people with blue eyes and brown hair from Japan who really like eating um, chocolate, all of a sudden you might get a smaller and smaller group. Um, and, and we raise this question of one, the sample size is tiny, right? You're looking at three people and it's hard to assess fairness there. And also it's sort of like, what is the meaningful approach? Individual fairness, which you alluded to, um, is this notion that, well, maybe it doesn't matter what group you belong to, it's sort of similar people should be treated similarly. And that's our notion of fairness. There's definitely a lot of interesting work there. I know that there is a concept called fairness gerrymandering, for example, where you can almost adversarially construct the subset where they experience the most unfairness compared to other groups and you sort of disprove fairness in that way. And I know that's a lot of really good work out of the uh, University of Pennsylvania there. The truth is that we have, I would say, I, have a few, I guess I have three thoughts here. One, by law, there are protected attributes, um, certainly in the US, that you legally cannot be discriminated against. I think that's a good place to start in terms of if we have to prioritize some groups and others where we start. Two, um, I think the context matters a lot. So in the context of something like dermatology, for example, we know darker skin patients don't have as good outcomes as lighter skin patients. That's a known situation. So maybe we'd be more concerned with that in the future. Whereas maybe we wouldn't be concerned necessarily as much about gender related disparity. So I, I would say the medical context matters too if we wanted to prioritize. And three, you're right that individual fairness is a very ripe area for new work. Um, I think right now I haven't seen, although I welcome anyone to send me information, um, I haven't seen individual fairness being applied in healthcare in a practical applied way. So I think that we're a little further out from there, but that is also a room for potential um, you know, future work. Yeah, and actually Sabrina uh, brings up a question which is pertinent to the field of healthcare in particular. And Sabrina is asking, how can clinicians contribute to this area? So how can uh, healthcare experts work with machine learning domain experts? Oh, that's, I mean, how can, how can they not? Like there are all, there are so many different ways. So our lab, um, Clinical Machine Learning Lab at MIT, we have clinicians in our lab who sit with us, well, used to sit with us and now virtually sit with us. Um, and we talk all the time about what, you know, what things to study in the first place, all the way to how could this be deployed? Um, what are the considerations there? So I think clinicians should be there each step of the way. Um, and also even the last step, you know, making sure that the algorithm is explaining things and doing things in a way that clinicians can understand and benefit from, that's also important as well. So um, I definitely think machine learning people have a lot to learn from clinicians 
at the very least, you know, we're not the first people to think that we can revolutionize medicine. So um, I think clinicians have a lot to, to, lot to teach us. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, so as I mentioned, we have, we're spoiled today because we have the blockbuster of two talks. So let me go ahead and introduce our second speaker. Um, and our second speaker is uh, our Peter Biswas and um, uh, another uh, very accomplished rising star. Uh, she is currently a postdoctoral fellow uh, at uh, Harvard University. Uh, her broad areas of interest include algorithmic game theory, optimization, and machine learning. Uh, she has worked on problems arising in the field of computational social choice theory and fairness in machine learning. Uh, she has prior experience in multi-agent learning, multi-arm bandit, incentive mechanisms, market algorithms, scheduling, etc. The list goes on and on. <laughs> Um, she has worked on problems arising from real world scenarios like online crowdsourcing, resource allocation, healthcare, dynamic pricing and transportation, ride sharing. Um, we're very lucky to have her. Uh, Arpita, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? I can indeed, you're good to go. Okay, great. Um, yeah, th thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. So um, today I'm going to talk about my work on uh, two-sided fairness guarantees for recommendation systems, uh, which appeared at the web conference this year. And um, I'm Arpita, I have recently joined Harvard University as a postdoc. And uh, before this, I did my PhD from Indian Institute of Science. And I have an amazing list of co-authors here for this work, um, Gaurav Patra, Nilay Ganguly, Krishna Gumadi, and Abhigyan Chakraborty. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. I'll start by describing what is a recommendation system. Then I'll spend some time in defining the problem of fair allocation of resources. I'll show how one can leverage the fair allocation problem to solve fairness in recommendation systems. And then I'll list some of the exciting results that we have so far, and finally conclude with a couple of future directions. So uh, what is a recommendation system? So in a very general way, recommendation systems are algorithms aimed at suggesting relevant items to users. So these items can be uh, like the movies uh, to watch or news articles to read, uh, products to buy, et cetera. And nowadays recommendation systems are unavoidable in our daily online journeys, mainly because of the rise of online platforms such as Amazon, Netflix, Airbnb, and all the food delivery apps. Now, um, an efficient recommendation algorithm is the most critical component of several e-commerce and online advertising platforms. Let us look at a scenario to understand the recommendation process. Um, now say that there is a user who uses an online music app and expects a personalized list of songs and music whenever they open the app. Now to create this personalized playlist for the user, the online music service runs a recommendation algorithm. Now what goes inside this is that the user is supposed to interact with the music app and um, in turn, the uh, app is going to store information such as uh, what kind of songs or music the user like, which one they dislike, or what are uh, some songs that they never listen to. And all this information is used to create a user mat matrix correlation. And um, using this correlation, the idea is to learn relevant scores between every user and music or song pair. And there are several ways how you can learn this uh, relevant scores. Now, once the relevant scores are predicted, the uh, standard practice across several recommendation system is to recommend the top K relevant items to the particular user. Because uh, traditionally the goal of a personalized recommendation has been to recommend products that would be most relevant to the customer. Now, while this top K approach maximizes satisfaction of the customers for sure, 
it may not be the best post processing technique when it comes to uh, e-commerce pla e e-commerce platforms where the platform need to balance producer satisfaction as well as cu customer satisfaction uh so just to give a brief idea about the multiple stakeholders we are talking about uh producers on one hand uh producers of goods and services and uh, customers on the other hand who consume the services and then the platform sits at the center of the ecosystem essentially controlling the information access through the recommendation services now uh, imagine there are uh, songs or artists uh, who are kind of producers uh, on the other side of the market uh, here what may happen is uh, th those may not form may not fall in the top k of any user and thus uh, i mean uh, they will never be uh, shown to any user in their uh, top k list and uh, this might be bad for the producers because they will not will get like zero exposure so on that note uh, we study this um, problem of providing two sided fairness uh, for this recommendation platform uh, where in one side there are producers and in another side there are customers and in a while i'll uh, explain what fairness we mean by uh, producer fairness and customer fairness so um, what we propose here is that instead of the post processing step to be uh, top k we would use the solution of the problem of fair allocation of indivisible goods and this problem stems from the theory of computational social choice where the goal is to find solutions that aim to provide welfare of individuals instead of solely trying to just maximize revenue so in the next few slides i'll talk about fair allocation of indivisible goods and what is fairness what what are some of the good fairness definitions for that problem so um what is fair allocation of indivisible goods so the problem is as follows you are given a set of agents and a set of goods or resources which is m and then the valuation of each good for each agent is also known now the goal is to find a fair allocation and by allocation we mean an n partition of this set of goods m so uh, here a1 to an uh, is the partition that we care about and uh, each of this would represent an allocation bundle to a particular agent now the key questions here is how can you do this partition such that uh, it, it is uh, fair where uh, the definition of fair itself is a big question like how do you define what is fair and uh, after, if you have a definition of fairness then can you show that such a fair allocation always exists so that's also a very important question in this space and the third important question is to uh, design algorithms that would find a fair allocation in polynomial time now uh, let's first look at some definition of fairness so for allocation of divisible goods also known as cake cutting problem there are two classical notions of fairness so the first one is envy freeness and an allocation is called envy free when the value of a bundle that an agent gets is greater than or equal to her value for any other agent's allocation so everybody is satisfied with what they have been allocated to so that is called envy freeness and uh, there is another notion called proportional fair share where um, an agent is uh, i mean every agent needs to Uh, have uh, al an allocation such that their value is greater than or equal to a particular threshold and this threshold is the valuation of the of all the goods divided by the number of agents who are participating in the in the split so this is called proportional fair share now uh, the problem with this fairness notions are that they do not translate well in the indivisible case uh i mean basically when the when you cannot fractionally allocate this resources then there's a problem and you cannot really uh have this fairness guarantees they are too strong so i'll um, let's look at an example for understanding this let's say you have like one laptop and two students now this laptop has to be allocated to only one of the student and then the other student would envy and it won't also receive the desirable proportional share so um this has led to the study of uh, other fairness notions which are more appropriate for the indivisible setting namely envy freeness up to one good or ef1 
and maximum share guarantee, which is also called MMS. So these notions are analogs of um, NV freeness and proportional uh, fair share respectively. Uh, now, recently, this fair allocation problem of indivisible goods have gained significant attention, and all these papers attempt to answer the existential and algorithmic questions for EF1 and MMS. Next, I'll quickly define what do we mean by this fairness notions. So uh, EF1, an allocation is said to be NV free up to one good. If for every pair of agents, say I and J, there exist some good in the other agent's bundle, which when uh, you hypothetically remove, you won't envy that person anymore. Uh, let's look at an example to understand this. Let's say that you have five goods and this is the split that has happened. And A1 is the bundle that agent one gets. A2 is the bundle that agent two gets. Now, um, let's, let's say that agent one actually envies agent two. So the bundle that second agent has got is more preferable to agent one. However, uh, so this is not NV free, but this allocation is NV free up to one good because there exists a blue ball in the second agent's bundle, which when you throw off, then agent one doesn't NV two anymore. So uh, basically saying that this A1, A2 may not be NV free, but this is actually NV free up to one good. And uh, the good thing about this fairness notion is it has been shown that in EF1 always exists and you can always find uh, and given any instance of this fair allocation problem, you can always find an EF1 fair allocation in polytime. Now let's quickly look at the second fairness notion, which is called uh, maximum <clears throat> share fairness. So here an allocation is said to achieve maximum share guarantee. Uh, whenever every agent gets a bundle, which is greater than or equal to this MMS threshold. Now, uh, what is this threshold? Uh, let's say uh, an agent is asked to hypothetically partition all the M goods into N parts. Now, uh, they are also said that they would be able to choose at last. So in the worst case, the agent would get minimum of the bundles that they have partitioned it to. So a rational agent would try to maximize the worst case bundle. And this value is known as the maximum threshold value. So the idea is to allocate it, uh, the resources in a way such that everybody gets more than their maximum threshold. And this would be called maximum fair share. Um, so regarding the existence guarantee, uh, unlike EF1, it has been shown that MMS may not exist. And hence, people have uh, looked at approximate maximum share notion, where instead of trying to achieve MMS threshold, the idea is to allocate alpha times MMS threshold, where alpha is a number between 0 to 1. Now, uh, with those definitions in mind, let's get back to the recommendation problem that we are interested in. So we assume that there's an online platform that comprises of N customers, each with uh, K slots and M producers uh, on the other side. Now, what are these K slots? So let's say due to the limited size of say a phone, each customer sees only uh, K slots when they open the app. So in this case, it is three. Um, so if, um, yeah, so now, now let's try to um, see that how can we uh, use maximum fairness notion to ensure fairness for the producers. So maximum fairness notion, if you can recall, it gives a threshold guarantee for the agents. So here, if you if we have to compute the MMS for each producer, this will be the total number of slots, assuming the value of each slot is one. Let's say the total, uh, you look at total number of slots and divide it by the total number of producers, and that gives you two. So MMS value for each producer is two. So Ideally, each producer would like would be uh, would feel it's fair if they are allocated uh, at least to two different slots. And to ensure that they are allocated to two different slots, we need some kind of a cardinality constraint, which would say that uh, no two um, copies of the same ad should go to the same customer. And this constraint takes care of that. And also there's an overall constraint that uh, every user should be allocated only three of these uh, advertisements. 
So taking everything together, we can formulate this problem as a constrained fair allocation problem with this hierarchical constraints. And um, we can use the relevant scores that the recommendation algorithm gives, which, uh, which basically tells you that how relevant a user item pair is. We can use those scores and value in, as valuations. And then uh, we, pro we provide uh, an algorithm called FAIREC that guarantees uh, EF1 allocation among customers and also uh, uh, guarantees MMS fairness, almost MMS fairness among the producers. Okay, in, in particular, we show that our algorithm returns EF1 allocation among all the customers and a non-zero exposure guarantee among all the producers. Additionally, it ensures MMS guarantee, alpha MMS guarantee to at least a large fraction of uh, producers. So uh, let me try to explain what this number would be. So if alpha is equal to one, so uh, if you want to see that how many uh, producers would get their exact MMS guarantee using our algorithm, that would be M minus K in, in, uh, according to the theoretical um, guarantee. And our algorithm also runs in polynomial time. So um, let us now look at some experimental results that we have. Um, so we, um, we actually evaluate our algorithm on some real world data sets. And uh, today I'm going to talk about one of them, which is called Google Local Ratings Dataset. So in this data set, there are around 11,000 customers and uh, 855 businesses, which are basically the local uh, stores and restaurants. And also we have around 25,000 ratings. Now to measure the customer side unfairness, we uh, use a matrix called, uh, we call it Y, and this is uh, capturing the average NV among all the customers. So what we try to measure is the NV between a pair of agents, and then we take uh, an average over all the pairs. Now uh, we compare our algorithm with uh, top K, which is basically uh, you take the relevant scores and then uh, assign the top K producers to each customer. And then random K where uh, you choose random K producers and assign it to each customer. So uh, note that top K is always NV free because in top K every user is getting their most relevant uh, set K set of items. So it's always, uh, it has a zero uh, NV. So the Y uh, value is always zero whenever we have top K. And this is for, so uh, the X axis is K. So we in, keep increasing the, uh, the number of recommendation size slots to see that how, how does it depend on the, this constraint. Okay, so uh, what we observe is that our algorithm is uh, very close to the top K in terms of unfairness. So it's almost fair. And um, in terms of random K, uh, if we want to compare it with random K, it has like a, a, some unfairness in, 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 uh, when we want to capture it via Y matrix. Now let's... Um, also look at the util customer side utility that, that we have. Uh, so utility for utility, we take the utility for uh, the total value received by a user using top K as the baseline. So this is always one. And then we compare other algorithms uh, that how bad they are doing in terms of utility when they are not using top K. So again, what we see is our algorithm FAIREC it is quite close to what top K is doing in terms of customer's utility. And uh, it is around uh, 10, so there's uh, at most 10% loss in the utility. And for random K, the loss is much more. And uh, after this customer side uh, measures, uh, we are going to look at producer side fairness measure. And again, uh, for producer side fairness, we would, uh, try to capture this matrix called edge that gives you the fraction of producers who achieves some alpha MMS. Now in the first graph, let's say alpha equal to one. So we care about all the producers who are getting greater than equal to MMS exposure. And uh, what, what we find is our algorithm is able to give um, 
then it's guaranteed to 100% of the producers. So all the producers achieve their MMS guarantee, uh, irrespective of the time slots, uh, so, sorry, irrespective of the uh, recommendation site slots. And um, another thing to note is uh, the top uh, K, which is, uh, again, the best algorithm for the customers is not that good in terms of fairness of producers because it only ensures that around 20% of the producer would get, achieve an MMS exposure. So um, yeah, so, so that, that's, that's where top K lags. And um, for random K, we see that almost 50% of the producers are able to achieve their maximum fairness. Now, um, let's again look at this graph where we now fix the uh, recommendation size to be 20. And now we uh, increase this value alpha. So when alpha equal to zero, you see it's always trivially true that everybody would, uh, would be allocated zero or more value valuations. So at alpha equal to zero, everything is here. So um, all the producers satisfy fairness, but uh, as we increase alpha, for example, when alpha is equal to 0.2, what we see is that for uh, our algorithm, again, all the producer satisfies 0.2 MMS, but uh, top K drops down to 0.6, only 0.6% of the producers actually achieve fairness. Um, so overall, what this graph says is that uh, even though our theoretical guarantee says that at most for, uh, so you can at, at, guarantee MMS to at least M minus K. What we see that in uh, all the practical, with all the data, real world data sets, we are able to achieve um, uh, this MMS guarantee for almost, I mean, 100% of the time. So the major takeaway is that with less, per, ten, with less than 10% loss in the customer's utility, our algorithm uh, is able to achieve the, this two-sided fairness in, in this kind of a recommendation framework. So as uh, so summarizing everything, uh, we provide a novel mapping of the two-sided fair recommendation problem to fair allocation of indivisible goods. We design an algorithm called FairRec with provable fairness guarantees. And then evaluating on real world data sets, we found that FairRec provides fair recommendations for customers as well as for producers without compromising much on customers' utility. And as future direction, the first interesting question is uh, what happens in the online setting? Uh, I mean, what happens when you, you, the customers registers one by one and they, log, they don't log in at a time? So uh, we, we need to have like a very different notion of fairness in that case. And um, it, it's, it's interesting to see how even, I mean, can you achieve some kind of fairness for both sides in this setting? And the second very important question is uh, po about positional bias. So uh, if you uh, recall the setup, we consider all the slots to be uh, uh, having equal attention. But uh, again, you can think about situations where the first slot is given more priority than the second slot and so on. So if, if that's the notion and if your value decreases uh, according to the lower you go down in the ranking of the slots, then um, a lot of things changes. So your uh, even, uh, I mean, the fairness definitions also needs to be kind of modified. And um, it would be interesting to see that, um, can you capture that as a, again, a fair allocation problem? So this would kind of lead to a submodular valuation function, but yes, it's an interesting open question. So, um, with this, we are towards the end of my talk, and I have some other results on fair allocation and also on fair classification. If you are interested, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And I'll hand it over to Sarah. Hi, Aprita. So thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, so uh, I believe we have a, a, quite a few questions. Let me share some of them your way. Um, so, uh, I, I think one is from uh, Hima, who says, thanks for the very interesting talk. A few things, if you could please elaborate on how scalable are these methods, um, i.e., when can these approaches fail, and what are the real-world implications of those failures? How do we prevent such failures? 
Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, it, that's a very important question. So uh, definitely this algorithm takes more time than what Top K does because it's, it's more than just um, picking the max and uh, yeah, th there's a lot more. So in terms of uh, the scale of uh, data sets that we used, it uh, didn't really take a very long time. So I think in terms of scalability, it would, I mean, uh, so the largest data set that we have considered is the one that I just showed, which is with uh, kind of um, 11,000 cross 855. So um, with that, it, yeah, it, it, it just, uh, took some few, a few minutes to run the run all the experiments. But um, taking it into real world, uh, I think the, yeah, it, it is important to uh, see that if we can have algorithms which runs faster. And um, I think the more important uh, thing is to consider the online setting. And uh, of course, I mean, whenever I think about this a problem going into real world, I would assume that there is like an online version of this problem where every time a customer comes in, you are you can compute something and show them a recommendation. And also in in uh, like asymptotically show that okay it converges to some fair allocation. But yeah, so this exact problem I think it's not yet there for the real world. Yeah, Charles brings up an interesting question, which is linked to the, I guess, last subsection of questions asked by Hima. So Charles was asking um, also about perhaps real world risks of deploying. Uh, Charles asked, would this kind of two sided fairness recommendation be vulnerable to strategic gaming in terms of the incentive structure it creates? Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, that that's that's something again to worry about that if you um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with that because there are uh, there are ways to um, game the system. Uh, for example, if you want like if you want more exposure, you just make more copies of yourself so that you are getting like more minimum guarantee of being exposed. So that's like a strategy somebody can do. But here we kind of assumed okay, there's no strategical agents. However. Uh, Again, studying this game with strategic agents is another very interesting line of work. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, I think that's a, that was a wonderful question. And yes, that that is another future direction, I would say. Yeah, I, I think to conclude, I had a perhaps broad question, which is, it seems that your definition on how MV is codified, as well as what is available data to measure MV is critical. Um, what is uh, the variance in an online setting uh, of, of how good our estimates of MV are? Right. I guess, yeah, there the estimates solely depend on how good the uh, recommendation algorithm is that is computing the relevant scores. So if the relevant scores are really correct, the uh, idea of NV is also correct in that sense. So we just rely on the relevant scores that is out that is coming out from some uh, recommendation algorithm. So yes, it is tied up to what the recommendation algorithm thinks what's relevant. And yeah. Uh, thank you for answering all the questions, um, and thank you for presenting today. Uh, I to to wrap up, I'd love to briefly talk about our our, our next uh, seminar series. So let me uh, share the screen again briefly. Here we go. Excellent. Um, and uh, we are actually, thank you everyone for attending. This was part of our Rising Stars talk series and the inaugural one where we profile early career researchers and talk about the amazing work that they're doing. Uh, it's one of uh, various inaugural uh, STARS series that we'll have over the course of the next year. Um, 
uh, we do have a bi-weekly seminar series, so please tune in again in two weeks when we'll have Ayanna Howard, who's going to be talking about making the world better with AI. Um, but now uh, we will actually be switching to the participant-driven discussion. So this will not be recorded. This is an opportunity for uh, casual engagement from our participants, uh, and a separate Zoom link will be posted. So we'll exit the webinar and end the YouTube live streaming, and you can find us there. I'll be there, coffee and hand <laughs> to engage about the wonderful topics that the presenter has discussed and introduced, as well as just to um, uh, learn about some of what you all are working on. Uh, so please do meet us there. Um, it, it is uh, more